Good evening and welcome to the last edition of the BSTAR in ESA's Universe event. Since 2016, this event was coordinated by the Swiss Space Centre in a collaboration with ESA and with the support from the Swiss Space Office. Traditionally, it was held in the form of a roadshow with presentation and talks at different Swiss universities. This year, due to a situation, we decided to move it to an online form with several different events dedicated each to a different topic. Since um, if you have missed uh, some of the previous sessions, you will still have a chance to watch them on our YouTube channel. Our last uh, edition today is about scientific mission, and in particular, the ones dedicated to exoplanets. As this topic is close to my heart, I am particularly happy to welcome our speakers today. We have Kate Isaac, who is a KEOPS project scientist at ESA, and she will tell us about her career path and about KEOPS mission. We have uh, Louise Nielsen, who is currently a PhD student at the Observatory of Geneva, and she will tell us about her career path from the younger day trainee at ESA to being a PhD student. We have uh, Valerie Kohler, who is a representative of the Swiss Space Office, and she will give us a broader picture of the space-related activities in Switzerland. And finally, Florence Lustello from ESA. She's a talent acquisition specialist at ESA, and she will tell us more about different programs and different opportunities for students and for young professionals at ESA. Please use our YouTube chat to submit your questions to our speakers, and please don't forget to indicate to whom your question is addressed. Please also fill in our um, survey in the description of this video to help us understand your feedback to this event. So welcome everyone, and I would like to start um, today with the presentation from Kate. So Kate, could you please tell us more about your career path and um, tell our viewers about what is the KEOPS mission about? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for the introduction uh, there. So yes, as, uh, as you said, Maria, my name is Kate Isaac. And I work at uh, ESA, at ESTEC, at the, so at the European Space Agency. So we just give my slides a couple of seconds to, to upload. Just my slides are just coming up, I think. So hopefully now my slides should be coming uh, coming over. Not yet. So maybe just whilst we're waiting for the slides to come up, as, as Maria said, what I'll be doing uh, today is giving you a little bit of, back, bit of background about myself, uh, how I got to, to uh, work in the job that, I, uh, that I'm currently working, and a little bit about the job uh, itself and the opportunities that one has at ESA as a scientist. So hopefully my and my slide. Again, okay, I'll try that. Bear with me. Hopefully my slides are, do you see the slide view uh, now? Oh, very, I swapped, yeah, swapped. Okay, very good. Okay, so finally, thanks for everyone's patience uh, there. So again, my name is Kate Isaac. I'm the KOPS project scientist, KOPS standing for characterizing exoplanet uh, satellite, which is a small satellite which launched recently from uh, Kourou. It's a collaboration between ESA and the uh, Swiss Space uh, Office. So 
let's go now into my uh, into my presentation as it stands. So, first of all, a little bit about myself. I am uh, Kate, and I have various different uh, hats and interests that I put on or play to at various different times. On a personal side, I'm very much into the outdoors. Uh, when I can, I like to. Uh, climb mountains, though this is a little bit tricky and challenging in the Netherlands where I work, as uh, we're probably one of the flattest countries in the uh, in the world. I'm a one-time uh, hang glider pilot. Again, this is challenging to do from the, the Netherlands, but instead what I do is uh, vegetable gardening. So here you see a picture of some vegetables drying in, uh, in our garage, hanging up nicely away from any uh, intred, interested mice and ready to be stored for the, the winter. I also have a keen interest in nature. I used to do beekeeping and I hope I'll get back into this at some point, uh, some point soon. So scientifically and from a pref uh, professional perspective, I work at the European Space Agency as a project scientist. I am first and foremost a scientist, but I specialized uh, over the years starting off uh, as a physicist and then narrowing down into astronomy. So I'm an astronomer and this is what enables me to do my job at um, ESA. It's the training as a scientist, as a physicist and an astronomer, which gives me the breadth of training and experience to do my job. And I've been at ESA now for 10 years, time which has flown past, but where I, during which I've used my skills to the best that I could. So how did I get to be uh, where I am? I started off, as you can probably tell from my accent, at a, sta uh, at a school in the UK. So I'm from the UK. Science always fascinated me, but it was not clear to me which one I should do. Should I do physics, chemistry or biology? They were all really interesting to me. I was very fortunate in that my parents were both scientists. And when I say fortunate, I mean that because to me, science was therefore nothing special in the sense that anyone could do it. Of course I could do it. And so I thought that it was an interesting, very interesting career and one that I could uh, pursue. And I had two role models to, to follow, both my mum and my, and my dad. I first studied natural sciences at Cambridge at a women's college called Newhall back then and now Murray Edwards. And this enables enabled me to get a breadth and depth to my science training. There I was able to do biology, physics, chemistry and maths and to delay the decision, so to speak, uh, on which one I would uh, uh, pursue as a career. I was very lucky. I had very supportive tutors there. Uh, and this was very, very useful, particularly given that there were only 10 percent of women in the final year of uh, physics. Having done my undergraduate course, I went on to do a PhD, which was two, uh, which had two components to it. The first was designing and building instrumentation to answer specific science questions. And the other was to do some science, which at the time was uh, cutting edge. And that was to study star formation in distant galaxies at submillimeter wavelengths using the telescope that you can see here, then called the James Clark Maxwell uh, Telescope. As part of my instrumentation work, I helped to build the instrument here, which is called Receiver W, which is a, um, a receiver, which is on the telescope still today. And for me, it was the combination and interplay between precision technology and orders of magnitude in uh, astronomy, which made my PhD particularly interesting, both practical and abstract. So having finished my PhD, I moved to work as a researcher, both in the UK and in the uh, US, working on both projects of my own and those of others. So working as a so-called um, postdoctoral research fellow or postdoc uh, for others and uh, on my own research, independent research and fellowships. Here I was able to combine both research and teaching, so lecturing, tutoring, and demonstrating in lab classes, and also to do public engagement and outreach with educational components, which I found to be very satisfying. Sharing what I do with both children and members of the public, and of course, taxpayers. I was then on the path of the holy grail of academia to a permanent position. Uh, and whilst I was doing on this path, the opportunity came up to work in a small team to kick off a European contribution to a, a Japanese space mission called Speaker. 
And here I took the role of project scientist within the community and there within the, this was within the UK. The mission uh, had the remit to, to look into star formation and the evolution of galaxies, stars and planets. So a very, very broad remit, but focused mostly on the far uh, infrared and submillimeter. Here I was able to um, use the skills which I particularly enjoyed developing over the years, and that was of instrumentation and research, the combination, combining science and technology in a very international uh, environment. So not just European um, scientists, but also Canadian and Japanese scientists. So a real mix of cultures, um, perspectives, and of course, languages. This was a space mission, which has the good, the bad, and the ugly associated with it. The ugly uh, being particularly the, the longer time scales, but the good being the fascinating science that one can do at the end of the day. So why ESA? Uh, working at ESA and in the job that I'm doing now enables me to, to combine science and engineering with answering key science questions, working in international teams, and at the same time, still pursuing the um, something which I hold dear to my heart, and that is to inspire others to do uh, science. And with all this combination, we're able to work on very interesting missions covering a wide range of topics in space science. I work on KOPS. It's, uh, as I mentioned, K uh, characterizing exoplanets uh, satellite. It's one of a, a series of space missions uh, to, that have been uh, launched to study exoplanets. It's the first in ESA's um, fleet, so to speak, a, 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 a series of three uh, missions, Chaos, Plato and Ariel, which will explore different aspects of exoplanet science. So the question that we're trying to answer as uh, exoplanet scientists is perhaps one of the most profound that we can uh, think of, and that is, are we alone? So are we alone in the universe? Before we can answer that question, we have to think about taking a smaller steps, so to speak, towards this question. And that is, are there any planets, other planets out there? What are they made of and how did they form and evolve? And are any of these other planets habitable in whatever shape or form we might define habitable to be? So to date, there are over 4,000 uh, planets that have been discovered orbiting stars other than the sun. Some are small, some are large, some are hot, some are cold. There's a huge range of different types of uh, planets with different characteristics in different orbits around very different stars to our own. But we haven't yet found anything which is quite the same as our own Earth. So what we're doing with Chaos is to measure very accurately the sizes of known exoplanets using high precision photometry in the optical near infrared. What we're particularly interested is in following up on known planets and studying known planets that are small, so Earth to Neptune sized uh, planets. What we also want to do is to identify particularly interesting targets with which, to which to we want to study, we will then study using other telescopes in more detail, the James Webb telescope, for example, and the largest ground-based telescopes uh, that we have today. So what do I do as a project scientist? I work at the in interface of science and, and engineering. So this is combining both science and in engineering aspects of a mission. My job is to maximize the scientific return from uh, the mission. And that means looking into a lot of different aspects of the mission, which could have an impact on the science that we get back, how operations are run, what performances we're able to achieve, what impacts the satellite might have on the detailed measurements that we're trying to make. I have a role in interfacing to the scientific community and making sure that the community can get the best use out of the, the satellite. I also work on outreach and education, so sharing what we learn about chaos with the general public and also uh, feeding this into school activities. When I have time, uh, and what other uh, project scientists particularly relish doing also, is research activities. So doing our own uh, science, ideally in the field which is related to our own satellite. And this is something I'm, I'm also doing. So here we have a few pictures which uh, capture chaos. 
the, the picture on the top left is a satellite in the clean room at Airbus, the uh, company which was responsible for uh, building the satellite. We have the instrument sitting in the clean room at the University of Bern, the Mission Control Center in, um, in Spain, the uh, uh, Science Operations Center in, in Geneva, so at Geneva Observatory, where a, a later speaker is currently sitting, and then a picture here of the um, science team taken, I think, in, in Paris. Fascinating experiences that I've got, uh, got to have over the years with KOPS include working with a very broad range of scientists but also, and engineers, but also actually going to the KOPS launch, which you can see in this picture here, which took place back in December. It's a very nice picture here of the, the launch trail. And also here, perhaps one of the nicest pictures that we, um, that we got over the, the years, and that's the first image from, from KOPS. So what does working at ESA enable me to, to do? And what, what, I, what would I like to share with you as being um, particularly satisfying? I would say that we have a very tangible end product, satellites, instruments to address key science questions. So questions which tickle the minds of scientists and are of importance and relevance and interest to scientists and to the public uh, as a whole. The job is very challenging, both scientifically and technically. But it's not just challenging, but it's also practical. And this is something which I find very satisfying. I get to work in teams of very smart, driven, and inventive and creative people. And that's something which one can start to take for, take, take for granted. It's very stimulating indeed. The end product and the end goal are fascinating in many respects, as I said, technically, scientifically, and of course, the scientific questions that we're trying to address uh, as a whole. An aspect of ESO, which uh, is clear from its name, European Space Agency, is the international environment that uh, uh, working at ESA brings. And this is, in, this is very stimulating from a cultural perspective as well. Different uh, cultures come at problems in different ways. And I think there are some interesting solutions that one gets just from the different perspectives that people have given their different upbringing. I'd say working at ESA is very dynamic, very char uh, fast changing. It's, uh, it's challenging in every sense and there's never a dull moment to be had. So what are the opportunities coming up in the science di directorate, which might be of interest to you? They're typically research fellows, which are advertised every year between eight to 10, the, uh, the opportunity being advertised on the September to October timeframe. The call for this year has, uh, has closed, but as I mentioned, it's every year. And the focus there is on astrophysics, planetary science, or heliophysics. Typically a two-year contract with a potential for an extension to a third year. For the first time uh, next year, there'll be a joint uh, ESO-ESA research fellowship opportunity. So ESO-ESO being the European Southern Observatory, so the, one could say the ground-based equivalent of, of ESA. And this will be a four-year contract with two years at ESA and two years at e, uh, ESO. It's a very exciting new opportunity which is being um, which has just been uh, uh, started. In terms of the job that I'm doing as project scientist, there will be positions coming up in the mid to long term. So in the five year, five to 10 year timescale, covering uh, a number of different aspects of science. So project scientists, it will be is typically focused on one type of uh, science, but there will be opportunities in, uh, in different areas. So I hope in this talk, I've given you uh, a little bit of a perspective of uh, what I do and what opportunities there are at ESA for someone working in, in science. Thank you very much, Kate, for your inspiring presentation. Indeed, as you said, it was a really nice overview to learn more about your career path, but also about the 
exciting details of the Kiosk mission and uh, about some uh, possibilities and opportunities for the students related to Kiosk uh, at ESA. Now I would like to give the word to Louise Nielsen. Louise, I know that you're currently a PhD student and uh, you're soon graduating at the Observatory of Geneva. You're working on the exoplanet research. And I remember many years ago I met you at ESTEC when you were a young graduate trainee there. Uh, so would you like to share with us your journey from a young graduate trainee to a PhD student and uh, tell us about the scientific missions that you were part of? Certainly. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Louise Durgo Nielsen and I've, uh, I've named this uh, a run through my, my, my short career so far. Uh, I've named it Exoplanet Seen from Space and from Switzerland. So, so as Maria just said, um, I was a young graduate trainee at uh, ESTEC at ESA in the Netherlands uh, four years ago. And I am currently a PhD student at the Geneva Observatory and I am handing in my thesis in three weeks. So if I look very tired, that's why. <laughs> Uh, so before I came to ESA, I had uh, a few different roles at ground-based observatories. So I've been a student support astronomer at the Nordic Optical Telescope in Spain. And before that, I was at uh, Gemini North in Hawaii. So this is definitely one of those careers where you get to travel a lot if, if that is what you're into. Um, I'm originally from Denmark and I got my bachelor's and master's degree from the uh, the University of Copenhagen, and I actually never worked on exoplanets till I came to uh, to ESA. That was my 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 beginning and my my exoplanet uh, journey. Uh, and I don't know if you uh, agree with me. I think that my photoshopping skills have gotten better over time. But I I, I did used to work with these uh, ground based telescopes where you can actually go and take a, a nice selfie in front of it. Um, but I'm now mainly uh, uh, working with space based uh, mission. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of a run through of what I was working on as a as a young graduate trainee or YGT, uh, and I'll also uh, talk about my my PhD work. So I think uh, Kate already showed this very nice uh, infographics from uh, from ESA that's showing all of the different uh, exoplanet uh, themed missions, both from ESA and from NASA. So in the, the bottom row here, you have sort of have these uh, all around observatories and on the top you have dedicated uh, exoplanet missions. Uh, so yeah, CHAOPS is, is flying at the moment and we're getting some really cool science from there. But of course, I will not talk about that because uh, Kate already uh, covered that. I will be mainly talking about uh, TESS, which is a transit survey mission run by NASA. And I'll also talk a little bit about James Webb, which is what I was uh, working on um, uh, as, as a YPT at, uh, at ESTEC. Uh, I should say that I could also talk about Plato for, for days and days on end, but I, in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just uh, stick to TESS and, uh, and James Webb. All right, so TESS is short for uh, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's a photometric uh, all-sky survey, and I'll say a little bit more about what that actually means in a second. But the idea is that we're looking for planets that transit the host star. So when a, a planet moves in front of its star, a, the overall brightness we receive from the star will go down. Uh, and we can try to search for these dips in the, in the magnitude or brightness uh, with space-based and ground-based telescopes. Uh, the level one science requirement for tests is to measure the masses of, sorry, it should be masses, it should be densities for 50 transiting planets uh, that are smaller than four Earth radii. And I'll say a little bit more about where this mass or density comes in. Uh, and then I think what's very interesting about tests is uh, we're trying to uh, observe the entire sky. So that means you want a, a large field of view. Uh, and uh, practically that means that you, you probably want to have a smaller telescope for it, for uh, well, the physics that lie behind it. So TESS uh, consists of four quite small telescopes. They're only 10 and a half centimeter each, um, but they observe the sky in sort of a, a, a rectangle or like a, a stripe over the sky. So the, that's what this uh, figure on the bottom right shows is how uh, TESS will kind of stop and stare at the sections of the sky. So it will look in one part of the sky for 27 days and then it will move to the next uh, next section um, and we've designed it or it's been designed in such a way that we have an area where all of these sectors will overlap and we have continuous coverage. So this is sort of what actual test data looks like. 
<laughs> so as I said, uh, we have four telescopes and each telescope has four detectors. Uh, so that is what you see here on the, on the, on the right hand side. These are actual images from, uh, from TESS and then uh, each telescope are kind of like uh, mosaicing on top of each other. Uh, so this is one of the very first images that we got to, we got to see from the, this really awesome uh, observatory. And I'm, I've just uh, highlighted one of the sectors here. Uh, so we can kind of get a, an idea of what it is we see from space. So if any of you have been to the Southern Hemisphere, you might uh, recognize this blob here, which is the Large Mag Magellanic Cloud. And then each little dot in this image is a, is a star that we are interested in, um, in observing. So the way we look for planets in this image is we pick a star, we pick all of the stars or as many of them as we can, and then we just count the photons that we uh, receive in this pixel, so to say. And if we plot that over time, uh, if we're lucky enough that we have a planet that is actually transiting its host star, we get to see dips in uh, the flux uh, over time. So in this specific case, we, uh, we see two transits uh, that are separated by 11 and a half day. Uh, and that means that the orbital period of this planet is 11 and a half days. We can also infer the radius of the planet from the, for how deep the, deep the, uh, the transit is. And this is really a very nice, very simple way of finding a lot of planets. So we do that for all of the stars in this image and the 16 other images I have on the side here uh, to figure out which ones of these stars have planets that are actually transiting. So in uh, my work, I, uh, I basically start from, from this data product. Uh, we, get, uh, we get a, a candidate, a transiting candidate, and then we try to follow it up with a method that's called radial velocity uh, follow-up. Uh, and we do that with the ground-based telescopes. So this is where the University of Geneva really excel. We have our own private telescope in Chile, and that's the one in the foreground here called the Euler telescope. And in the background here is an ESO telescope. So that was the um, European Southern Observatory that Kate also mentioned in her talk. And they have a state-of-the-art instrument as well called HAPS, which is built uh, here in Geneva as well. <clears throat> So radial velocities are both simple and can be kind of complicated as well. But the idea is that when you have a star and a planet that orbits your star, both the star and the planet will be sort of moving around the, the common center of mass. So that's what you see in this movie. I hope it translates well to the, the webinar. Uh, this is what we see seen from the top. But because we are, I am interested in planets that transit the star, that means that we don't see this uh, happening like this, we see it uh, edge on from the side. So that is what you see in the bottom uh, uh, bottom plot here, bottom diagram. So mainly what we see when we have this uh, <laughs> these, uh, this planet and the star moving around the common center of mass is that the, the star appears to be wobbling back and forwards. And we can measure that through high resolution spectroscopy where we measure the velocity of the planet or the sorry, the velocity of the star very, very accurately. Uh, and we've been become so good at measuring this very accurately uh, that uh, a team of uh, Swiss scientists got the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics last year. So that is uh, Michel Mayor and Didier Coulot, who were some of the first people ever to uh, were the first people to ever discover an exoplanet outside of our solar system back in 1995. So this is really uh, where Switzerland uh, excels. So there's a very interesting interplay between space missions and ground-based observations here. And this is how the test mission, for instance, which is a, a planning on measuring not only radii, but also masses of, of uh, small planets. That's, that's where we need to have this collaboration between uh, ground-based facilities and space-based missions. All right, so going back to this, uh, <laughs> to this um, overview I showed before, I just talked about TESS, which is maybe a, a NASA mission, but in the future, ESA is uh, launching PLATO, which will be uh, deploying some of the same uh, methods to find exoplanets, but in a much, much larger scale and to a, a very high degree of, of precision. So <laughs> you can't really talk about exoplanets in space without talking about James Webb. So uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be the largest space telescope ever in, uh, built uh, and flying in space. And it's set to launch uh, just 12, mo 12 months from now, one year from now. So it's, uh, it's really, really exciting. 
James Webb is very different from TESS. So I, I told you, said before that TESS consists of four te telescopes, each 10 centimeters in diameter. Well, James Webb is one telescope and it's six and a half meter uh, in the diameter. Uh, it will have four different instruments and working in the near infrared and mid infrared. Uh, and it will also have this a huge sun shield, which is covering 150 square meters. Uh, which is uh, about the size of a, a tennis court. So this telescope is so large that you can't uh, launch it into space as it is. You will have to deploy a lot of these things in space. And uh, that's going to be a, a, it's got to be just as exciting to uh, to follow as the American election uh, today. <laughs> just to, just plug it from now. Uh, so I would say that James West uh, James Webb, uh, as opposed to TESS, is a little bit of a Swiss Army knife telescope. So it's going to be able to do everything. It has a lot of different types of spectroscopy uh, and photometry. It's also going to be doing direct imaging of exoplanets. It has a coronagraph. Uh, there's really a lot of different opportunities with, uh, with the instrument. And that's where my uh, position at the ESA came in as a young graduate trainee that I was uh, focusing on uh, one instrument called NESPEC, uh, and I was trying to simulate how we can uh, measure the atmosphere of exoplanets using NES uh, NESPEC. And the idea is really here to support the, the instrument building community, but also the scientific community in seeing what is feasible with NESPEC and given a specific science objective, how do you reach this objective? So. Uh, at a very uh, low practical way of thinking about this, it's, uh, a, what, what exposure time should, should I use, for instance? How long do I need to observe for to be able to, uh, to uh, measure what I want to measure? So I've included here a case study of the Super Earth GJ1214, uh, but I'm, I'm just going to like leave it here. And if there are any questions later, I'm happy to, to say more about what this work really entailed. So that was my, my main job as a, as a young graduate trainee. Um, and if uh, anyone is interested in, in learning more about my experience or what I was working on back then, I, I will invite people as well to ask questions uh, later in the session, but also go to my personal website, which is here, and that includes contact information as well. And I also include some other uh, links uh, if you're interested in hearing more about the Geneva Observatory. Um, I'm also part of a, a national center of excellence, which is called Planet S. It's a Swiss uh, center that's uh, all about exoplanets, both in Geneva, but also Bern and Zurich. And we do have a newsletter that you can subscribe to if you're interested in following exoplanet news in, in Switzerland. Uh, and then I also include some websites on the TESS and James Webb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, I think thanks to you and Kate, we now have a very nice overview of the exoplanet science and uh, exoplanet missions in general. And our next speaker is Valerie Koller from uh, Swiss Space Office. Valerie, if you would like maybe to share a bit of your also personal background and then tell us a broader picture of the um, different um, space related activities in Switzerland and maybe tell us a bit more about other scientific missions that Swiss universities and Swiss industries participate in. in. Absolutely. Thank you, Maria. I'm just going to put up my slides. Okay. It's also taking a while, it appears. <laughs> Maybe I'll just try to redo that. And in the meantime, I'll do it like just like Kate. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit until they come up. Um, I'm actually uh, quite excited to be here uh, because I was an attendee of such an event myself a few years back of such a be a star in, in uh, ESIS Universe event. And I'm really looking forward to to share my 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 fascination. Uh, with space um, with the audience today. Um, okay, I think that is looking better on the on the slide front, hopefully. Um, so um, as I said, I was I was an attendee uh, myself and actually since this is about a career in space, um, and because the start of my career in space, started uh, at ESA as well, uh, 
is why I would like to quickly share my, my background as well. So I studied maths and astronomy and theoretical astrophysics here in Switzerland. And during my master studies, I had the chance to do a student internship uh, with ESA, which is yet another uh, possibility uh, for, for students in this case to get a, a good uh, insight to what ESA is actually doing. Then I finished my studies and I had the opportunity to make a trainee with the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs here in Switzerland, uh, where I actually um, worked on space-related issues on a multilateral level, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more later. And now I'm working for the Swiss Space Office, um, which is a great place to combine your interests in, in, in space and, and politics as well, because uh, um, I'll also talk about it, uh, that later, since ESA is a uh, um, organization with 22 member states, um, things are, are also political. So this brings us to uh, Switzerland in space, or space in Switzerland, actually uh, both. Um, I'm showing you here a picture of a recent launch of a Ariane 5 rocket. And if you zoom in, and I'll do that for you, um, you can actually see uh, the member states on, on the two boosters. And on the bottom right corner, you see the Swiss flag. So Switzerland is one of the founding uh, members of ESA. And Switzerland does have a long standing history in, in space research. Um, so I would like to give you a, a few a few insights on why we why we do space. So uh, this is one of my favorite picture uh, showing the moon, and that's actually where one of the big success stories of space space research uh, started uh, with the with the, uh, during the the first manned uh, lunar landing where Switzerland had the one and only non-American experiment on, on the moon, a uh, solar uh, wind sail, which you might have heard of. Um, but that's not, the, that's not all we do. We don't only produce uh, those, those uh, flags. Um, we're actually interested, interested in space uh, for a, a variety of reasons. I listed three here. Uh, one is the utilization, so the applications uh, that space allows us to create. Um, and this image is showing uh, some, some data or like aggregated data from a meteorological satellite, which is only one of the very, very many applications uh, that, we, that we have from space. Um, another one would for sure be navigation uh, through the different um, uh, satellite systems that we have all over um, Earth. Then, of course, uh, we are curious human beings and that's what triggers a lot of a lot of scientific questions and we think that it's important to follow our natural curiosity and then what Switzerland is really good at is to find niches and create and build some highly um, specialized uh, parts for for space instrumentation uh, to do science or also to build um, to build spacecraft uh, we do that through ESA. Uh, Switzerland does not have um, a space agency, so the European Space Agency is our agency, uh, which is why uh, a very, very large part of our activities are done through ESA. Not all of them. We have other, other activities with international partners, but ESA is our main partner. Um, there's also, and that's uh, an important partner of ESA as well, the, oops, uh, sorry, the European Union. And what I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the multilateral uh, aspects of space, and uh, what you see here is the, uh, the logo of the United Nations. Um, Switzerland is a member of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which is, is a forum where uh, nations from all over the world, not only Europe, discuss uh, questions related to the space space uh, exploration and use. So today it's about space science. Um, and in Switzerland, we are very proud 
We have uh, some of the world leading uh, institutes all over the country, actually. And in a recently uh, published article, it said that Switzerland is actually punching above its weight in space science. And I, I, I like this metaphor. I think it is true. It's quite impressive what, what the scientific community in Switzerland is, is doing uh, and has been doing for, for a while. Um, since you're talking about exoplanets today, I chose this picture, uh, which is showing Cheops. We've heard about it before. Um, it's also showing uh, a few people you might recognize. There's the Swiss principal investigator, Willy Benz, and there's the former federal counsel, uh, Schneider Amann. And there's also kids in the room. And why I chose this picture is because I like uh, the, the the atmosphere it creates, it shows um, that science is really about the exchange um, between the scientists and the community and the politicians. Um, and that's why I chose this picture. I think it's, uh, it's a good representative. But in Switzerland, we don't only have exoplanets uh, science. We have a very strong community in, in for example, uh, mass spectrometry, um, in solar and heliophysics, in satellite laser ranging, in X-ray astronomy, in space life sciences, and the, the, the list doesn't stop there. Um, so uh, there's really a lot of different and very exciting areas of research. I'm going to give a few examples of recent ESA missions where Switzerland played uh, an important role. Um, maybe you recognize them. So I'll start with the, I'd call it the, the, the oldest, uh, which was uh, Rosetta, down in the bottom left corner, um, which uh, visited the comet Churi, and uh, the lander of Rosetta actually touched down on that comet uh, six years ago now. Um, and uh, Switzerland was uh, played a major role in a mass spectrometer that was on the orbiter, um, to measure the composition of the very thin atmosphere of the comet. Then on the top right corner, we have a uh, solar orbiter, which launched recently and carries various Swiss instruments or uh, instrument contributions on board. And the first uh, uh, results are coming up, so that's very exciting. And on the top left, um, it's hard to recognize a spacecraft. <laughs> it's actually Beppi Comolombo. Um, and uh, it's taking uh, a picture of parts of the spacecraft. And uh, in the background, you actually see Earth, which is also a very nice, very nice image. And on board of Beppi Colombo, uh, which is a mission uh, that will fly to Mercury, um, uh, are uh, also uh, different instruments with Swiss contributions. In short, Switzerland is actually involved in, is or was involved in almost all the science missions of ESA. And uh, we are very uh, happy that the Swiss scientists continue to, to have such a strong interest and deliver such excellent uh, results through, through their contributions um, to ESA. So the careers at ESA, and I'm not going to go into detail since we also have uh, an expert uh, here and some, some uh, Things have already been said, but from our um, perspective, we want to foster and promote um, space careers for young people that are diff um, that, that can be interested in, in a variety of different um, topics. It's not only engineers that ESA is looking for or scientists. There's a variety of of, um, of topics where you could uh, get involved with, and. I think Kate uh, had said it uh, in the beginning that at ESA you will work in, in very diverse and multidisciplinary teams, which, uh, which makes working uh, at the organization a really exciting and an engaging uh, thing. Um, and that's where I'll hand over uh, back to Maria. Um, just one my last slide. If you have questions, of course, you can post them in the chat or, or reach out to me personally. I'm happy to, to try and answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie, for this uh, very nice overview. And uh, with your last slide, it's also a really nice bridge to welcome our next speaker, who is uh, 
talent acquisition specialist at ESA is Florence Lustalo. Florence, could you tell, uh, please tell our viewers more about the different opportunities, uh, different career opportunities at ESA for students and young specialists? Yes, uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for the presentations. And in fact, I have heard quite a few words which which I quite like, and you will also hear them in my um, in my presentation. But first, uh, before we go uh, to to the uh, presentation of the various uh, programs at ESA on the entry level programs, I would also like to say one word that um, about, uh, in fact, <clears throat> my way to arrive at ESA, which uh, which was not straightforward after university. Uh, and I think it's important to say to all our, uh, all the viewers that your career, it's not what you do specifically just after university, you will have a path. And the most important is, is the driver and uh, the, the driver to this path. And it should be indeed something that you like to do, something for which you have an interest, a passion, and maybe in a few years' time, you will look back and you will say, hmm, in fact, I've done many things, but there was a logic and a common point in all the steps I've taken. For me, it was a multicultural environment, which I was looking for people. And it's why I've always worked in places like HR, let's say, like where I am now in STEC in ESA. But before that, it was when I went through Germany, England, Italy. And interesting enough for tonight, the place I was working at before ESA was ESO in Germany. So, and I'm not a scientist. So now back to the, uh, back to the programs of uh, ESA, uh, we have our um, first, let's say, entry level program, which is the interns program, um, which offers quite a lot of topics for internships from three to six months. And in fact, we are going to publish quite a few uh, opportunities and topics in this week, about a hundred. The only, let's say, um, um, disadvantage this year is that in view of the situation we all know we have to uh, make these opportunities remotely. So if you apply and you get your internship, you will have to do it from your home, uh, be it in Italy, in France, in uh, Spain, even if the opportunity is open in the Netherlands or in Germany or in Italy. So uh, this is uh, for the first, uh, the first, let's say, entry-level program. Then we have the Young Graduate Trainee Program, and uh, Louis spoke a bit uh, about it already. Um, the Young Graduate Trainee Program is every year. We open something like 110 opportunities. And this year, we will not open them at the end of year, but in February 21 for a recruitment in September, October 21. Okay. Uh, this Young Graduate program is for all of you who are about to graduate or have just graduated. You don't need to have professional experience, okay? You may have a few internships, you will have made projects at university, but you don't need to have a, a professional experience because it's a, a first experience that we want to give you. Okay, and as was said already, for our one young graduate, uh, young graduates, we offer a very, let's say, dynamic environment, multicultural, multidisciplinary, where the trainees work in very close collaboration with the experts, with their tutors, who guide them on a daily basis, but also where they have the opportunity to network, to meet other experts in other environment, where they have the opportunity to be with other peers, YGTs, uh, national trainees, 
and discuss so many exciting, let's say, topics and things that they wouldn't have suspected, let's say. So uh, I think that the, on the YGT, um, as I said, take note, opening of the opportunities in February 2021, the next, um, the next round of recruitment. Besides the uh, young graduate traineeship, we have the national trainee program. So the participants to this program, the trainees, the national trainees, have a similar profile to the young graduate trainees. However, they are recruited by their national agencies, of course, in cooperation with ESA, and they will work also then in a team together with other YGTs, together with a tutor, together with experts. They will come for one year with uh, possibly uh, extension of contracts for two years. And uh, we have a few, let's say, um, national pro trainee programs, such as uh, Switzerland, Germany, Estonia, Luxembourg, Belgium, Ireland. So we have quite a few of them on the DATES. I will now continue with the uh, research fellow program. And there also Kate uh, spoke about the research fellows because I would say most of our research fellows are in the science directorate, okay? And um, research fellows come for two years with a possible extension for a third year. And here I will say that they, their, um, let's say their focus is more on science, science applications and technology. Whereas, so I didn't say it, but for the, let's say, young graduate traineeship, the focus is uh, engineering more than uh, science area, but also we have opportunities in the science area. Uh, we, all our candidates, all our, let's say, recruited um, YGTs, research fellows, students, are citizens, nationals of ESA member states, ESA cooperating states, as well as Latvia and Slovenia as associated member states, and also Canada as cooperating states. This is also something quite important to know. As for the um, research fellows, uh, we don't have a specific campaign like we have for the uh, young graduate uh, or for the students. A research fellowship opportunities are opened all year long. In fact, at the moment, we have something like six or seven opened in the, uh, in the, um, on our website. So if you are interested, you can have a look. And uh, maybe in one few weeks, we will have two others opened in the area of Earth observation. So we have quite a few and there is no campaign. It's all year long. So if you are interested by, uh, making a research fellowship at ESA, I can only advise to set uh, an alert and just be open what is happening. Last but not least, our co-funded research program. It's, a, it's a, a program which has replaced recently the uh, NPI, and there we have PhDs and postdocs. So for this program, where the, the, let's say, the PhD or the postdoc uh, candidates are not on site. They are not in, uh, in ESA. They stay, they are at university, but they have access to the uh, ESTEC labs in particular. It's a cooperation between ESA and universities. And as you can read, ESA is co-funding up to 50% and up to 90K research at PhD or postdoc level. And this, I think, for a maximum duration of three years, if I'm not uh, wrong. But if you go to the website ideas.esa.int, you will um, have all the information and details on this program. For this program, because the, the, the cooperation is between ESA and the university, uh, the let's say the fact of being a national of a NESA member state is less um, important. Now, 
uh, I would like to go to the um, the profiles, let's say, uh, that we uh, are looking for at ESA. And to start with, I will speak a bit about the engineering disciplines, a bit in uh, electrical, mechanical, uh, systems, software, telecom, all kind of engineering disciplines are interesting. Uh, uh, if you are interested in making your career in space, don't, let's say, limit yourself. If you have been studying uh, engineering, whatever specialization, just try, look what you are interested in, in our opportunities, and probably there will be uh, an opportunity for you. We also have, of course, uh, a lot of our uh, YGTs and research fellows with a, sci a scientific background, a bit in mathematics or environment, environmental science, sorry, uh, planetary science, space science, life and material sciences. So this is um, also quite uh, broad and uh, as a discipline, scientific disciplines. And last but not least, we also have some profiles in, in case uh, some viewers are also interested. Uh, some profiles with a business and administration background because we recruit a lot of engineers and scientists, but to recruit them, we also need them to support them. We need people with an HR or finance or law background. And also, uh, I uh, see on, I want to mention the uh, information technology environment, which is very important and will be also crucial for the future years to come. Now, as a, in general, what are we, what kind of profile, what kind of profile are we looking for when we recruit young graduates, students, research fellows, but also uh, people on permanent positions? And we want, we look for people on a edu with an educational background at master's or PhD level, if it's for a research fellowship or in a science environment. But there I come back to what was said before. We look for people who have a passion, who have, who are enthusiastic, who are uh, maybe thinking out of the box, creative, innovative, people who like to work in team and in particular, who are interested in a multicultural uh, environment. And we often say that we like to work in team, but we like to work in team with, uh, uh, which are made of uh, diverse talents. And this brings me to, to my next slide on diversity, because ESA is really engaged and committed to diversity and to make uh, its team of people diverse uh, diverse teams. So uh, also what is very interesting for our young uh, community is that uh, ESA is a very friendly environment with a lot of activities which are going beyond the working environment. And it's very important for all the young community to really build and uh, be together, okay? I think with this, I have reached my last slide and I can only advise uh, you all to go on our career website, to our website already, but also to the career website. And in particular, for the ones who are interested in uh, young graduate traineeships or PhD or student, you can set up an alert in our um, career website to not to miss any opportunities. And this is also valid, by the way, for the ones who would be interested in a permanent position. So set an alert, don't miss an opportunity, and apply if you see uh, an opportunity which is in line with your background and especially your interest. I think I can uh, give you uh, the floor now uh, back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice overview. 
And uh, now it is time for the Q&A session. And I would like to remind our viewers, please don't be shy, submit your questions in our YouTube chat. This is your opportunity to learn more about careers in our scientific missions. And I see we have a few questions already. Uh, the first question is to Florence. Is the young graduate trainee program also suitable for uh, graduates with the um, background in computational science without a background in physics? Mm -hmm. As I said before, no, I thought I was muted. As I said before, yes, if you will see what I recommend you is that you, uh, and I will take this opportunity if you allow me to give two, three advice on the applicants, because I think it's good for everybody to know that. First, you can set up an alert in our system, as I said, to, to not to miss any opportunity. When we will, in particular, publish the opportunities for young graduates, read them. Try to find the one which corresponds to you best, to the one for which you would like to work, the ones which would give you, uh, yeah, for which you have a motivation and an interest and enthusiasm, so, and apply. And if something is not fully, fully in line with, the, uh, with your profile, I'm pretty sure that uh, you you can also, um, it, it's also good to apply. Don't block yourself, you know? So yes, go ahead with the computational uh, uh, background. And then uh, third, if you are selected, no, before you are selected, when you have chosen your opportunity, prepare your motivation letter and your CV very well in a clear, concise, but also detailed way so that we understand who you are. And remember, this is the first step, the first contact we will have together, you and the recruiter. And then if you come for the interview, prepare, just uh, look a little bit in the website and see what ESA is. Prepare for interview, it's very important. I think that no one will contradict me on this one. So, sorry, I've been a bit long, but I thought it was important to pass this um, few advice to our viewers. Thank you very much. That was very nice. And uh, I see we have another question, which is uh, related to the first one. And somebody is asking what kind of task would a computer scientist perform at ESA? And in particular, would this task be related to machine learning or um, data science? If you know that, Florence. That's a difficult question for me. If anyone wants to answer it, then uh, maybe Kate also, you can help me always. But uh, in any case, I would say that, there, yes, there are so, we have a lot of opportunities more and more in machine learning and in um, artificial intelligence and related to uh, uh, computational activities. So I, it's difficult for me, honestly, to go in details of what you would do on a daily basis. But uh, if uh, Kate or uh, Louise, you want to help me on this one? Yes, absolutely. I can, maybe I can comment, uh, Florence. Uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is becoming more and more significant in, in science, particularly as we move to larger and larger data sets. It's no longer possible for individuals to go uh, through uh, deta in detail uh, individual observations, but uh, we need to make use of, uh, of machine learning to, to get the best out of data. And indeed, there are opportunities in, in science, for, for sure. Thank you very much for this clarification, Kate. And maybe if I may ask you another question as well. So we know that um, there are many different scientists uh, working on KIOPS project, uh, but uh, how exactly does the KIOPS team look at ESA? Do you have mostly scientists or, or engineers or PhD students? Could you tell us a bit more about? That's a very that's a very interesting uh, interesting question because Kops Ke is uh, is a bit different from typical uh, ESA missions. We're we're a small mission both in in the size of the satellite, uh, the duration or the time it's taken for us to to go from the very first steps of Kops through to to gathering data, but also in the teams. So science wise. 
Um, unlike other ESA missions, I'm the only scientist working at ESA on Chaos. So I have to say, I'm not rep Chaos is not representative. I mean, it's a partnership between Switzerland and um, uh, ESA, and very many of the science uh, type uh, jobs or those uh, which involve scientists are actually held by scientists working in uh, in Switzerland. So working at the University of Bern. In the instrument team, and also in the uh, uh, University of Geneva at the observatory, working on the so-called Science Operations Center. So at ESA, there's just me. <laughs> um, but on a typical, on a more typical ESA mission, shall we say, say uh, of, uh, such as uh, Plato, there would be scientists primarily working actually at ESAC. So this is the Science Operations. Um, part of uh, of ESA and they would be working to develop the science operations which is the, the aspect of the mission or the of what, what we do um, once the satellite has has actually launched this uh, center has to be developed over the years so there's work to be done not just once the satellite has launched but very much in the development uh, uh, of the mission uh, also. So it's uh, this is where um, majority of scientists would work. Thank you very much for your explanation. And with this, maybe if I could ask Louise, uh, from your time at ESTEC, could you also tell a bit more how, how the team looked like uh, for the project that you're working on? Yes, so I was, um, I was in the science department. Uh, and at the time, that would consist of the faculty members. So grown-up scientists um, then we were a few YGTs and then uh, around five or six um, uh, research fellows um, and I think working at ESA as a scientist is very different from working at a university as a scientist so um, so the faculty is made out of people that have very different science objectives and work on very different uh, science projects so I think uh, when I started, I had one office mate that worked on uh, on exoplanets as well. And then there were uh, two two other people in the faculty that worked uh, on full-time exoplanet science, and Kate is one of them. Um, but then you also get to talk to people that work on uh, gravitational waves and uh, high redshift galaxies with James Webb, for instance. So it's very diverse in that sense that uh that when you when you build up science teams that are centered on a on an instrument or a, an all-around mission such as james webb then you also get to uh, interact with people that have very different science objectives to yourself um and i think i, I want to expand on it a little bit beyond that because especially as a ytt you don't only talk to the people in your uh, division but you also get to talk to all of the other ytts so i now have friends that are working on all parts of, of, uh, of aerospace, uh, from data science to rocket building to uh, acoustic systems or something like that. So it's, it's a really amazing opportunity to get to know a little bit about all of the different subsets of, uh, of systems in, in aerospace. Thank you very much for your story. And it sounds like a really exciting opportunity as a, a young scientist at Adisa. Uh, now, coming back to Florence, I have some uh, other questions um, from the YouTube chat. Somebody is asking how recent should the master's degree be to apply for the young graduate trainee or the national trainee? Uh, is it okay to apply, let's say, two years after receiving the master's degree? Yes, um, I would say so far, yes, we have our YGTs are either uh, candidates are either the ones who are about to get their graduation or have just graduated, but we also have uh, candidates and we have recruited YGTs who have had their, uh, let's say, um, degree at master's level, uh, one year, two years, up to max, I would say, three years before. Okay, so two years is still still okay especially if you have made internships and uh, this kind of experience afterwards and uh, another one about the young graduate trainee um what are the criteria for the selection for the young graduate trainee apart from the nationality 
must. So as we just say, then the first the education, okay, uh, master level, for the YGT master level, for the PhD, for the um, research fellowship PhD, okay. Even for the student, you should be on your way to obtain your master level in your last year or second but last. For the national trainee, also the master level. That's one criteria. Another one, which is less tangible, of course, I, I cannot explain it with, uh, uh, with figures, but uh, curiosity, uh, teamwork, uh, taking risk. Uh, Kate was mentioning before, at the beginning of her speech, she said, being innovative, yes. Then Louis said, fascination, interest, motivation, enthusiasm. These are all words which I find are extremely important. And when you look at what you have done, because you are at the beginning of your career, of course you haven't, you don't have so many, so much experience, but you may do practice some sports, you may be very interested in music, we, everything is important. Everything that makes your interest and mind open. This is what is important. And, and teamwork. And I would say also a flexibility, availability. When we say open-mindedness is towards the others and what you like to do. Maybe, I don't know if I've summarized okay, but uh, I think probably yes. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for that. And I have another interesting question. Um, somebody is asking, is it possible to do an MBA a company project within ESA? Well, normally when you come to ESA, you already have your master, be it an MBA or another uh, degree. So you can, you can study while you work, but if you come as a YGT, at least you should already have a master. Then if you want to make a master in parallel, then it's your choice. But I would recommend when you do your uh, YGT at ESA, just to say about that, huh, about the YGT, just focus on this traineeship. F focus on your young graduate traineeship because you will have so much to learn. One year, two years, if you are extended, go so fast. And we have said many times tonight about, we have spoken about the community of YGTs from whom you can also learn. The community of experts, of tutors from whom you can learn. So there, it's so much, it will be so rich and so enriching that I wouldn't concentrate on doing other studies in parallel. Now, if you want to do uh, your MBA and you, you are studying for MBA, maybe you can come as a student. But that will be the other kind of program, not the YGT. Thank you very much for your answer. We have a question to Kate. Um, Kate, could you please share with us some uh, recent uh, exciting results from Keops mission and maybe also some uh, personal lessons learned from um, your work as a project scientist on Keops at ESA? Yes. Sorry, you're muted, Kate. Sorry, I double, I pressed the button twice. <laughs> in my enthusiasm to, to start speaking yes maybe to take the the first question i think it's it's an interesting one where we're i mean we're sort of let's say of order of six months into a so-called routine operation so we're, where we're sort of routinely going through the observing plans and observing the targets that we have planned to 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 study so at this point the the first results are just just starting to to come out so i think in the next couple of months, there'll be some really exciting uh, results that you will you will come across in in the scientific literature and also on the on the ESA web pages. I can say that the performances that we're getting, and by that I mean the sensitivity of KOPS is 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 well, the sensitivities are very good. So in order to be able to measure very precisely the sizes of planets, we need to have a very stable satellite. 
and a very um, and a very um, precise measurement of the light from the star as the planet moves between us and the star. As, Le as uh, Louise mentioned, we do transit photometry, and we need to measure the size of that dip very precisely. And Chaos is doing extremely well. We're meeting the performances that we that we need to be able to measure very uh, precisely the sizes of the smaller planets, the Neptunes and Earth-sized planets that we're interested in. So I would say there, watch watch this space. Then I think your second question was on uh, part of the question was reflecting on my personal experiences as a um, as a project scientist. What I put uh, is is that correct? Uh, Maria, so. Yes, so uh, the person is asking about your anecdotes or learning experience as a project scientist. Yes, I think my, my learning experiences, I mean, I had to smile throughout uh, Florence's uh, uh, um, talk and also uh, her answers because it's exactly, it's exactly that. I mean, it's the, it's the flex, it's the need, it's or the need and the ability and the requirement i would say to think on your toes so you you come into problems that are completely different from those that you've experienced before and you have to think on your feet there's so many times when you come across pop problems which are similar but yet different to those that you've uh, considered previously and i think it's that that makes our job or my job very challenging but very stimulating because you're always learning new uh, new situations new opportunities but also from different colleagues you come uh, you work with people coming into into teams with, with different backgrounds different expertise and you learn as you go along and that's what i find to be particularly um particularly interesting you grow i'd say it's not so much an um anecdote but it's something which is very stimulating about uh, the job that i i have I'd say you're never bored. <laughs> you might be, you might be um, uh, overwhelmed with the amount of things that you have to do, but it's it's never boring. So I hope that I hope that helps. I hope that answers at least touches I'm on. Sure that helps. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. That's that's really interesting. I have a question to Valerie for the Swiss students. If they're interested to uh, have a career on scientific missions, maybe not only uh, for exoplanets but scientific missions in general would you have an advice on the universities or maybe industry that are working on on the project related to scientific missions in switzerland yes thank you for the question um so as i said before there's a, a large amount of institutions um universities or or um or the the um, universities of applied sciences as well that offer uh, very interesting um master degrees or where you actually can collaborate with professors or, or lecturers who are involved um since we have someone from geneva here i mentioned geneva first uh, um, then we have the University of Bern uh, that is uh, heavily involved in a variety of space missions, uh, ESA missions, but not only ESA missions, uh, CHEOPS being one of them at both universities, Geneva and Bern. Um, then, of course, we have the, the two um, technical uh, universities, the ETH in Zurich and in Lausanne, where you can uh, study, uh, I'd say, to be... Um, to be to work more on the technical side to be an engineer but not only um, we have interesting projects going on uh, in uh, maybe you've heard of, of insight where they have the uh, this instrument to to measure um, earthquakes or Mar I, I shouldn't say earthquakes it's Mars quakes actually so quakes on Mars um, and then uh, we have uh, the Fachhochschule Nordwestschweiz and they're involved more in uh, in different projects as well. Um, some of them are more related to uh, data science and software, um, mainly in the in the area of uh, solar and heliophysics. And then I need to go through the through the map of Switzerland. Um, and there, I mean, you can study. Um, physics or astronomy in in other universities as well university of zurich uh, university of uh, basel 
in the Università della Svizzera Italiana. So, um, and, and I, would, I would like to echo actually what has been said before, especially by Florence also, that um, it's of course important to have a, a good education, but I think once you, you do something that you're really passionate about, and then if you want to go uh, towards space, then you can do it even if you have not the the one and only um, uh, study degree that is on the job posting. So I really would encourage everyone to still apply for, for jobs, even if they uh, don't fit exactly the opening. I mean, I, I'm a, a master in mathematics and I still did my student internship at ESA um, actually in, in the strategy department. So it was about uh, relations between member states, which is completely different from what I did. But I think the, the, the passion that I had for, for what, I, what I did was um, apparently the, a reason to, to hire me or to let me do that internship. Um, so yes, to sum it up, I mean, there are a few institutions who are more involved directly with ESA. Um, I'm summarizing in them again, it would be Geneva, uh, Bern, ETH, uh, Zurich in Lausanne and the Fachhochschule Nordwestschweiz. Um, there's also an institute I should not forget actually, which is the um, PMOD, uh, which uh, is the Physikalisches Meteorologisches Observatorium uh, Davos. Uh, they're doing very interesting science. It's not a, a university, so you cannot really um, study there, but um, I know that you can do some some um, postdoctoral research there as well for, for the ones um, a bit further in their career. I hope I did not forget anything there. Um, <laughs> uh, if the others want to jump in. Uh, and then otherwise, back to you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much for your overview. Maybe, Louise, if, if you have something to add on your side for the exoplanet specifically. Ooh, um, yeah, I think I, I think generally there are really good opportunities for working with exoplanets, both on a science and a, a technical point of view in Switzerland. Um, so all of the universities that were just um, uh, mentioned. Um, but I think one thing that I really like about exoplanets is that um, it, it's one of those sort of early fields within astronomy where it feels like we're just starting to scratch the surface and we have a lot of really amazing uh, space missions coming up very soon that I think will take this this um, field very far. So it's really like this is the, the time to join the bandwagon. I think uh, we're just taking off. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe a follow up question for you as well. So your time as the young graduate trainee at ISA, does it really help you to get a PhD position or like, would you recommend this path rather than doing a PhD, let's say directly after obtaining the master's degree? So I think for me, it was definitely the right thing to do. Um, so I actually, I got my uh, YTT position a year and a half after I finished. Uh, I, had, I had held other positions in the meantime and I did other internships and well basically when I finished my master's I didn't want to stay in academia I was pretty sure I was never going to do a, a PhD um, I wanted to work with telescopes and hands-on uh, science and do more teamwork uh, oriented stuff uh, but it was actually when I was working at ESA my my supervisor there looked at me and said what are you doing you should if you want to work in academia you, you need a PhD um, so, so with that said, I think if you finish your master's and you know you want to do a PhD, I, I don't think that necessarily there's a reason to not go out and do a PhD, but for me, it really helped me in my scientific work now. I think I'm a lot more mature as a scientist, um, but of course I'm also uh, a little bit older than the people around me. <laughs> Uh, so, so this is really a, a personal choice. I think in terms of uh, being able to get a PhD or to get the PhD that you want to, to get, uh, it definitely helped me having, uh, having worked at ESA. The, I think that that's why the, I got the position I have. Thank you very much for sharing your experience and uh, good luck for your PhD defense. There is another question to Florence. Um, so you told uh, a lot about uh, different opportunities for 
students and uh, young professionals, but somebody is asking for the permanent position at ESA. Do you need an industry experience or a PhD, for example, to get a permanent position at ESA? Well, this this is um, a broader as a question. It depends. So, PhD. If we say in the uh, job opening that a PhD is required, it means that the position is open more in a science environment, be it the science in the science directorate or the science in the Earth Observation Directorate or the science in the uh, um, Human Space Flight Directorate. If we require a PhD, there is a strong scientific component in the job, to say the least. Now, otherwise, uh, as I said before, for the, the, the engineering positions, we need the master. And yes, industry, uh, at least a few years of experience in industry is obviously welcome or in, in an environment which is in line with the job open. Okay. So if you apply as a mechanical engineer or optic engineer, probably yes, if you have a few years of experience in industry, it's positive. Okay. Thank you very much for the information. And uh, with this, it's time to conclude our Q&A session. I would like to thank all of the speakers of the today event and a big thank you to you, our viewers today. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the show and um, please visit the ESA website if you still have uh, more questions. And uh, please don't forget to fill in our survey to provide your feedback on this event. We hope that uh, you enjoyed the whole series of events be a star in ESA's universe. And if you missed the opportunity to watch them live, you still have the opportunity to watch them on our YouTube channel. And uh, with that, uh, thank you again and wish you a nice evening and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.